Hello everybody, it's Sunshine and welcome once more to my studio. Today we are jumping straight back into our six authors, six questions series. We are up to episode four, which is all about creating a storybook world. Now I'm very excited for this episode and I can't wait to hear what our authors have to say. So without any further ado, let me introduce you to our wonderful band of authors. We have Danica Hello, Patterson, Michelle Worthington, Hi, Mary Sunshine. Ann Pierce, Meredith Costain, Hello, Adrian Sunshine. Beck and Adam Wallace. So take it away, Meredith. How do I create a storybook world? Um, well, first of all, um, if it's something uh, like series fiction, where I know the readers are coming back and back to read more, I try to um, create a place, a comfortable place, an appealing place, where where kids, when they're coming back to read the story, they, they feel like they're settling back in with old friends um, and they know where they are. So with, with a series um, like, oh, well, Ella Diaries, but also her little sister, Olivia's Secret Scribbles in particular, um, her physical environment is very important to who she is. So she's got a, a bedroom up in the attic um, and she, ooh, because I, because most of my um, writing now is junior fiction, they're illustrated. So it's wonderful. Um, the illustrator, Danielle McDonald, spends a lot of time showing what's going on in the bedroom. So she's a bit of an inventor. So she has an experiment cupboard full of things that, you know, bits of mold, j jars with mouldy bread and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that sort of stuff. But she's also got a window, an attic window that looks out over the neighbourhood and she can see what's going on out there. Um, and she's building a time machine in the corner and as each book goes on, there's a little bit more being added to the time machine. So it's a sort of place, I hope, where she can come back, but then she can move out from those places. So she plays soccer, so you know she goes to the park, um, what it's like at school with her friends, things they do in the playground. But I do try to keep bringing in little details. There's a cat, that belongs to the neighbour next door that's often sunbaking on the tiles as she opens the window there's donkey sitting outside there so um, I think it's a matter of of building up a world that kids will settle in oh here we are we're back in Olivia's world what's the next adventure going to be so it's sort of like a nice safe place to keep coming back to my storybook worlds I think I've got two camps with this, depending on what I'm writing about. Most of my picture book stories are about nature. They're inspired by nature. So most of my worlds begin in the real world. Then we tangent from there. And usually there's some imaginary factor that comes in, but most of my stories are strongly rooted in the real world. So Jackaranda Magic, I will go and hang out under a Jackaranda tree when I was writing that. Scribble the Gum Secrets, there's a little forest, um, you know, of native bushland down the road and I would literally go and sit there and just watch and be quiet and pay attention to the sounds and the bugs and the trees. Uh, and then inevitably the fi fiction creeps in, you know, to those stories and I think, well, I, I can see this, but what if? And so I began to pull into the real world environments um, some elements of fiction and some elements of make-believe um, for the characters. And I think that's the bulk of my process. Probably there's one particular chapter book, um, manuscript of mine, where the world has clearly come to me first and it's nothing to do with reality. So I feel like I've only really fully world built once in all the manuscripts I've written and in all the books I've published, I've really only created a world from scratch one time. And I don't know how I did that, to be fully honest. Um, but yeah, nine times out of 10, I'll start with the real world and we'll build on that from enhanced reality. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think in your writing makes the worlds you build believable and real, particularly for readers? I think the believability in the worlds I build comes in for readers um, because I do pull in the five senses. It's a trick I use a lot in both my world building and my character building. So for example, with Scribbly Gum Secrets, when I went to sit in the bush to write a lot of that story or to think about, um, you know, what sort of, um, what sort of adventures my characters would have in that environment. I was paying attention to what I could smell, what I could see, what I could touch. Um, and weaving those things into the story 
um, consistently um, is really helpful for making that world feel functional. Mm. How do I book, build a storybook world? It's one of my favourite things to do, really, I have to say. And I think I build it through asking questions. I ask myself so many different questions. What's the weather like? You know, um, is there, what's the geography like? like? Is it hilly? Is it, is it a water world? Um, is it a hot, arid world where there's hardly any water? Um, so once I have an understanding of the physical side of the world, then I start looking at, okay, so are there cities? Is it just a little town? Um, what's the infrastructure? You know, are there governments? Are there no governments? So there's so many different layers to building worlds. Um, I think two things are really important. One is that you have to be logical when you're building your world. So you can't have people uh, on an anti-gravity world, um, you know, doing certain behaviours. So, or if you do, then you have to have an explanation for it. So it's that kind of stuff that it makes sense. What makes sense? If I'm going to make all these rules up about my world, then they have to make sense. Mm -hmm. And if they don't make sense, then there has to be a reason. So it's, 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 a, it's a process of asking yourself, what's, I often start with our world and I say, okay, what's the same in my world as in my world that I'm making up as the world that we live in and what's different. And so I find that that's a really helpful way to kind of narrow things down. And in terms of making it really believable, I think that it's all in details, but, but, big but, the art is not overwhelming the reader with too many details. So you have to pick the little details that make it feel real, make it feel grainy, like, like you're really there without a deluge of, and then there was this, and then there was this, and then there was this kind of thing. So um, I'll just give you one really quick example. When I was writing The Night Creatures, series I knew it was all going to be um, or the, the island they run away to is in complete darkness so there is never any sunshine so what's that going to do to the people that live there they don't have any color in their skin because there's no need for pigment you know the temperature is always at a certain uh, within a certain range so there's all sorts of things that once you design a world a certain way then you have to look at at what that means, um, you know, for how your characters will inhabit that world. So it's fun. It's fun. Wow, what a great question. So when I'm building the worlds in my stories, I actually start from real life. And I think that's a bit of a tip uh, for people because when you start with imagination, there's no boundaries and you can kind of get a bit lost in your own world. So I like to start with something from real life and it might just be one little touch point. It could be maybe a pond or it could be something that would be translated from real life into your world. And it gives you a point of reference because I think it's really important that you add, even if you're making a, a, a full magical make-believe world, that you've got the element of real life in it. And I think the other important thing to add is that it can't be a perfect world. Something has to be wrong with your world because the reader in their normal day will have stuff that goes wrong all the time. So if you want them to think that your world is believable, you need to have stuff that goes wrong in your world and automatically your reader will be thinking, oh, actually, I've kind of had that sort of stuff happen to me, so I believe that this world could be possible. I think a convincing world is one that invites the reader in instead of necessarily um, blocking the reader out. And a great way to do that is to use a lot of sensory storytelling in your world. So what can you see, but also what can you hear? 
what can you smell what can you taste so if you if your world is next to an ocean maybe you can you know smell rotten seaweed or you can taste the tang of the salt water on your tongue like there's so many different ways that you can actually invite a reader into your story and that makes it more believable but it also is much more fun because then you get to use all this beautiful language and then the reader just becomes totally immersed in your wonderful magical world excellent question sunshine and a very tricky one to answer in one way because i hate description i don't like reading description i don't like writing description i want to leave a lot up to the reader and i want to get the stuff happening as well so in terms of creating my world it's very rarely you know the forest was dark and the town was this and three pages describing a forest. It's a forest we all know what a forest looks like so a lot of it is through the character and the support characters, I think, with mine. So I'll often I'll start a story with an idea of the character and then where I want the story to go to and then just chuck him into situations that are from those opposite situations or what the character won't want. And through that, the world and the support characters start coming in. And so it kind of builds as I write from that character and what I want them to do. So once, once they're trying to get to what they're going to do, you've got to bring other um, locations and other characters into it so that then they can respond to that and then that as I'm writing because I don't plan my stories so as I'm writing it, it goes where it goes and so if they meet someone and respond to it in that way then something else has got to happen so then another part of the world is going to build from there so yeah that's how I do it totally by fluke <laughs> so Adam how do you decide what the world's going to look look like based on a character like how do you work out where they're going to go that's a, another very good question that my brain is going <laughs> look it's, it does sometimes just happen often so my favorite character Pete McGee he was a boy with one arm who wanted to be a knight his mum's sick he had to go find a flower to save her and so it was, a, it was a journey, it was a quest, but I knew it was set around that sort of time of night. So the time obviously makes a difference that it's mm -hmm. set. And and then the characters are going to relate to that time and the things he has to do are going to relate to that. And there's a bit of magic in it. So often, yeah, often it's the character, but also where they want to go does start to find the world. So I, I really don't think about it other than a general setting at the start. So it might be a general, yeah, let's say I'm writing a book about pirates it's going to start what's well, going to obviously involve pirates in the ocean but then as things happen i don't want them to be in the ocean all the time so they're going to come up they're going to have different things happening and as i write it the world the world will appear to me almost as i write it like this is not always the case but often especially with longer ones yeah the world appears as i go along as opposed to me thinking what the world is situations i'll think of opposites for the character so again mm -hmm noisy kids i want to chuck them into a library so this book's about the kids going to the library because they're really noisy and that's where it'll start and then the mm -hmm. and then there's a librarian and then there's other customers then there's there's parents and then there's so then the world and the characters build just from thinking about that initial sort of mm -hmm. idea creating storybook worlds now that is one of the funnest parts of the whole process because i kind of think a little bit like you need you need some characters and that takes you along that way and you need a, a plot which takes you along that way so you want the whole story to be going sort of in a diagonal line but in the background the characters and plot have to be playing in a wonderful setting and that is the world that they live in so you need those all those three elements to be working together now sometimes worlds can be dictated by the character that you first come up with and i in my in my books derek Dahl's super cool um I, he's a bit of a rat bag to be honest with you <laughs> um based on myself when i was younger he's a bit of a rat bag <laughs> so i wanted his world somehow to reflect uh what he's like so you know the local shopping center is a bit run down the school's a bit run down uh there's a sewerage plant up the top of the Sorry. river and everything stinks, right? So um, sometimes your worlds can be a little bit of a reflection of your lead characters. But on the other, on the flip side to that, I've written the Little Legends series and we have written, basically Nicole Hayes and I have gone together to write a world which is sort of the ultimate footy story setting. So 
they live on the beach, you know, um, and they yeah. play footy a lot on the sand and then they just wander off uh, through the bush and they head to the footy oval, which is, you know, got a view of, of the, uh, the ocean and all that sort of thing. So sometimes the best thing to do is to just think of the ultimate world that your characters could live in. I think mm -hmm. often the characters come first, then you think of the ultimate world that they could live in. And it's almost like building a Lego set. Oh, what could I put here? What could I put there? Yeah, right. You know, and sometimes when you get to the illustrators, the illustrators are like, oh, should we add this? Should we add that? And you're like, no, no, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there. And I'm like, man, how did you know all that? You know, and it sort of happens in your head and you don't realise that it's happening. But I think you basically start with the character and then think of what world the character would be best suited for, where you're going to get the most plot, the most fun, the most action, and then dial that up to 150%. So the ultimate footy setting or the ultimate run down town. And then I think that's the way of making a great world. Fantastic, everyone. Thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant as always. Now, I love this episode. It is my favourite episode out of all of this series because it's about world building and I love building worlds with my artwork. And it's really interesting to hear about how authors build worlds with their words. <laughs> One thing I really loved about this was how varied everybody was and it seems to vary more depending on what kind of books that you're creating. So if you're writing kids books or middle grade or young adult or adult, it seems like these worlds are getting more and more complex, which I guess makes sense as your audience gets more and more complex as they grow. Something else I found really interesting is some of our authors really like descriptive things, like descriptive writing. And some of our authors really hate descriptive writing. Me, I'm one of those people in the middle, I like both. Um, but I think it's so interesting to see how personal preference all of this is. And that's definitely something that I've been surprised by for this whole series, is how much of writing is really personal preference. Part of being a writer is be, being able to write what you want to write in the way that you want to write it. And I guess this is what makes the authors individual. You know, there's so many different authors out there and some you like to read and others you don't. It's all very personal preference. I like this, I think it's great. You know, it means each of our authors has their own unique style. Anyway, that is it for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. <laughs> Next week's episode is all about getting published. So it's basically all the nitty gritty stuff um, about getting into the publishing world. As always, if you want to find more of my work, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook. And I am still twitching on a Friday at 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. And I've also started a Discord server. So I'll put the link down below there somewhere too. Don't forget, if you are an aspiring author, make sure you go and check out our authors pages because they have some really great resources for up and coming writers. Um, I will put their links there below as well. So that is it. I hope you all have a brilliant week. From me and all my yeah, authors, see you later. Incredibly hot studio today. <laughs> have a wonderful day and keep on painting. Bye. Oh, and writing too. Yeah. Bye.